Welcome to the Children's Book Author Podcast. I'm your host, Eleanor Page. If you write for children, or it's always been your dream to, you're in the right place. As the children's book author, I'm on a quest to discover everything there is about writing, publishing, and marketing children's books, as well as how to supercharge my creativity, skyrocket my productivity, and absolutely everything else there is to know about how to be the best, so you can be too. Join me as I interview fabulous guests and become the children's book author. Welcome back to the Children's Book Author Podcast with me, Eleanor Page, your fellow children's book author. This is episode 12 with children's book author Kate Gordon, and the topic is the courage to persevere. We say that a lot on this podcast, I feel, persevere, courage, confidence. These are kind of key words, right, because they matter, and if you want to stay with something long-term, There's going to be moments where you want to quit, where there's so many obstacles that, you know, there's this thing lately in the world where people say, if it isn't easy or it isn't coming together or it's not happening, maybe it's the universe's way of telling me it's not right. Well, I would say occasionally that's true, but the majority of the time it's because the universe is saying to you, How much do you really want this? Do you want it a lot? Then overcome the obstacle and keep at it. I had a fantastic talk with Kate in this interview. She took a really long time to write that first book and I felt so much that there's a lot of authors out there like this. Yet me, I'm this sort of person that writes stuff and throws it out into the world even if it's crappy. Crappy, I don't know if that's an Australian word, basically means, you know, it ain't the best, but that's how I learn and that's my style. Other people will take a long time to find their voice, to create something that they're really happy with, to edit it several times. And that's okay too. You can take a long time and still you can get there in the end. And you're going to love this interview because Kate, despite those obstacles and changing what she wrote at one point, She brought together her hobbies, her passions, her love of horses, her love of writing for children, and she did it. And she's also the founder of of the website and resource Kiwi Kids Read Kiwi Books. The links for that will be in the show notes. And it's amazing. She's inspiring children in New Zealand where she lives to actually read books by other Kiwi authors, which is amazing. Hopefully someone starts one of those in Australia. Hey, I don't have time, but if you're listening to this, I would love for you to be the one to do that. (laughs) Hint, hint. In any case, enjoy today's show. I hope you find it immensely valuable in your journey to become the children's book author. Today I welcome to the show fellow children's book author, Kate Gordon-Smith. Kate does write children's book, but she has a very particular specialty. She loves writing, I'm going to read this so I get it right, fantastical adventure stories about brave friends, ponies and unicorns. (laughs) But as well as doing that, Kate is also the creator and founder of the online bookstore Kiwi Kids Read Kiwi Books, as well as being an extraordinary marketing PR. It's a side job. Is that about right, Kate? <laughs> Welcome to the show. No, thanks for having me on, Eleanor. Um, yes, it sounds like I do lots of crazy things and um, I am quite busy, but it's all good. Yep. You are so. quite busy. So tell me a bit about how did you go from being a marketing PR to writing pony and unicorn books for kids? <laughs> why, why those things in particular? Like, was it something you always, is is it part of your life or did you always want to do that? Why that? Okay. Very much the horse books is part of my life. That is, those were the books I uh, loved most when I was a child and I was a pony rider and I'm just about to buy my first horse in 30 years. 
So, you know, I'm coming back to horses at this point in my life, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I think the whole writing books thing came about about 20 years ago. I figured I could write a novel and, and you know, like lots of us, you just sort of charge into, into it and then go, oh, there's quite a lot of craft to learn here. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time learning the craft, even though I had was overrun with ideas. Um, and then... I was trying to write romance because I was part of a romance group and I had to make some really good friends. And I kind of had an epiphany that why was I not including horses and dogs in my story somewhere because they were the stories I love most. And at least let's give ourselves the passion of writing about something we love to share the stories we liked to read. So, and I think that's where a whole lot of things really started to come together when I made that realization so everything I've got lots of other stories that I haven't written yet and they nearly all involve horses in some way and because I'm pretty sure there are other people like me around the world that love <laughs> love books about horses yeah yeah but I, I love that because you know so many people think about you know what do I create that might be popular or that other people might like and I've heard it said that people get like they don't often look at the first obvious place, which is what do I like? Who am I? Because let's put it this way, your romance might have worn off after writing 10 of them, maybe, like who knows, yeah. right? Yeah. But it sounds like your love of horses is so deeply entrenched in you. I guess so, yeah. And uh, Look, I probably could have written quite reasonable romances, but – was my heart really in it? You know, was were they the stories that lit my passion or my fire for continuing to create? So, um, yeah, the, the challenge. Oh, back to your original question around how do I fit it all in? I, it's a struggle, like most of us, to fit writing in around a day job. Um, especially my day job is also quite creative at times. You're, you know, writing content for social media, writing newsletters. So it's more writing. Well, always writing something um, and it can yeah it can, it can be challenging but equally when you do get into a regular routine of working on your book and the th and your passion project it is just you know so satisfying enormously satisfying but then even though writing uh, your th and you've got one book out at the moment so it's Lily and the Unicorn King and you're working mm -hmm. on the second one is that right that's right so, I mean, even though you've done that and it's kind of your passion, you have pursued it commercially. You did publish it. It's got a gorgeous cover. It's very professionally done. You've actually done a whole lot of research and work in order to now present that book to the world. So why did you not just write it as a little passion thing and stick it in your drawer or give it to, you know, other kids in your life? Why did you go commercial with it? Golly. Um... Because I really, I did, I, I want to be a published author. That you know, that was that was the key. And I had a lot of friends in the romance world doing very well in indie publishing. Um, and I just felt, even though it's indie is not such a big part, perhaps, of that junior fiction, middle grade fiction, it was very much the path I wanted control of my own destiny. And yeah, you live and die by what you do in a way, don't you? And it, 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 the book marketing side is hard. You know, there's a lot to learn, but it's also, I guess, because I have that marketing background, you'd like to think you can bring some of that knowledge and, and expand your knowledge all the time to try and do better. Yeah. Writing that second book is very key at the moment. Get that out there. Mm. But nonetheless, I know I'm repeating this a little bit, but like nonetheless, I feel like how did you have that confidence to actually, you know, like a lot of people wouldn't. A lot of people might go, oh, my gosh, I don't know if this is any good unless, a you know, a traditional publisher gives it a stamp of approval. What inside of you is brave enough, courageous enough to take this thing that you've made and actually share it, as I said, commercially with the world. What, where does that come from in you? Maybe I haven't really thought about it 
in a way, uh, but 30 years in marketing and PR, you'd like to think you can write something that is of a publishable standard. Yeah, and I did, I did have quite a few friends input and it did go to a developmental editor and a proofreader. So there were, you know, I went through the steps, the, the steps that you need to do. It's, it wasn't just up to me and I did, you know, I used a cover artist who um, had designed a lot of, done a lot of artwork for for mainstream publishers as well as indies, went to someone who's um, an established cover designer in terms of doing all the title and everything. So, I, I did, yeah, I did work hard to to put all of those elements together, and then it's a leap of faith, isn't it, that you've done enough <laughs> to put your baby out in the world, and then you go, oh, <laughs> what are people going to say? <laughs> Yeah, but again, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I'm sort of taken aback by your level of courage in doing that, really, because despite all your research and all those wonderful things that you put into place, uh, to me, it, it says something about you that you want to actually share your story with other kids and that you've got a really strong, like even deeper than loving horses and unicorns is you have a deep love of helping children. Is that right? Yes, it, yeah, it is. And, you know, the, the first round of reader feedback when, it, when actually children were telling me what they thought of the story was actually the the best thing. I'd, I probably hadn't anticipated how amazing that would feel to have that feedback and, the, and just asking, well, when's, where's the next story in the series? And that was like nearly two years ago. And you're like, oh, well, I've been quite busy. Um, and... Yeah, to be able to share a story and have other people enjoy your story is is actually what it's all about, ultimately, for me. Yep. Why kids? Why kids, like, out of every other age group? Why couldn't you write pony stories for adults? Why kids? I might still write pony stories for adults. You might, but, um, you might. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess because it's what I felt I knew best. And I still go back and read a lot of the pony stories I read as a child. And I still love being lost in those worlds and um, yeah, sharing in those adventures. Yeah. And, and could, I, could I offer that to other children? And that's really what I hoped I've been able to do. Did you write yourself as when you were a child? I did. Yeah, I think I was taught to write before I even went to school by my older sisters. And um, the best thing the teacher could ever say was, let's write a story. And I'd be like the first one out with a page going, right, well, I've got a story. Um, I really wish I'd kept a lot of that stuff. I don't remember. I don't think my mother ever did. Um, but yeah, stories and libraries, going to the library to get books out. Just love being lost in a story. Favorite thing. Mm. What else is your like creative influence? Would you say? Um, my mother has been strong, and you know, when we talked about setting up this interview, I was thinking about what is creativity and and where does it flow through in our world? And my mother made all sewed all our own clo our clothes for us as children. She had amazing gardens, so there's that kind of visual creativity, and and as well as the plant knowledge of what grows well where and all that sort of thing. Um, she went to pottery classes, she made metal work and so there was always something happening at home. The, you know, art was encouraged, reading and writing was encouraged. So we were we were fortunate in that way. Mm. And has do you think that's part of why you want to now encourage other kids in the same way you were encouraged? I guess so. I hadn't necessarily articulated it in that way, but yeah, if if you can encourage others to to explore their own creativity, I think that would that's an amazing achievement. So, what then led you to creating the the Kiwi books for Kiwi or Kiwi Kids Read Kiwi, Kiwi books? books. Website. Yeah, I know it's a bit I of a mouthful. Get it right. It's, it's a, a little bit of a mouthful. Um, really good alliteration, isn't it? Kiwi Kids, Kiwi Books. Kiwi like Kids, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of K's. And, and in fact, we now have uh, four authors called Kate, so there are more K's. <laughs> a Kiwi Kates. Um, crazy. Anyway, so that was very much around me saying, well, I have a book that's set in New Zealand. How do I reach book buyers, uh, you know, New Zealanders buying books for their kids who might be interested in the story? And I'd been involved in setting up my husband's business online store 
um, and kind of those two ideas came together and, and, and literally the, the name for it just kind of like popped into my head one day when I was having a regular Skype call with another writing friend. And um, that was last August or July, July or August, and by November I had it live, and I'd never built an online store before. <laughs> so, so like, well, I built, kind of pretty much did the whole website uh, with the support of some technical people. Um, yeah, again, actually quite a creative process in terms of how do you want things to look visually, what story are you trying to tell, what journey are you trying to take your buyers on. Um, yeah, it's been a huge learning curve, but really exciting. Yeah, really exciting. It sounds so like everything else you've done. Like to me, the way that I see you, correct me if I'm wrong, is like you get this one idea and then you're you're crazy creative in every aspect of your life. Like you decide how you're going to market it. You decide how you're going to create the product. You suddenly learn about self-publishing, which is really very creative because you're putting together a whole lot of things mm. that you normally wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be doing if you were traditionally published. Yep. And then you're now putting together this entire online store and then working with other authors, which is, again, another level of creativity. It's like, whoa. So I get from you that you're a real sort of self-starter, go-getter. That's the kind of the, the lesson I'm taking, that you don't let something stop you you actually go find out how to do it and find a solution to a problem, which is what creativity kind of is, right? Finding solutions to yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I think it's something I've come to a bit later in life. You know, I did the, I did the corporate stuff for a long time, and and perhaps your own creativity doesn't have that um, free reign. You know, I can make the choices now about about what I want to work on. I mean, I'm not entirely financially free to do that. I have to do everyday pay and work like a lot of us. But um, the thing about working with other authors is sort of like the – I knew there were some amazing New Zealand authors writing books for children and teens, as there would be in Australia. And um, – the more the more I'm getting, the more people I'm getting to meet, the more books I get to see. I'm just blown away by the standard of the work, and and yeah, to have the opportunity to help them reach more people is actually probably I possibly hadn't anticipated how cool that was going to be, because it really has been amazing. And yes, yeah, so we started with eight authors, and I'm just so ever grateful for those authors who who jumped on board before I even had it, li had it live and um, I'm just about to add the 30th author in, in four months so and go have with more than 100 books so that's um pretty exciting that's so exciting what sort of things do you notice across the authors what kind of things about them pop out to you stand out as kind it's of like kind of qualities a, yeah it's kind of the diversity of of the worlds that we choose to build and um, the, what we choose to tell our stories about. And, and so I guess there isn't really one theme because there's, um, you know, such a variety of books, but it's just, yeah, demonstrating that we, we all think in such different directions and, and what, what's an exciting story. I mean, there's are amazing stories to read, but what's what drives someone to write one story versus another story? highlighting I mean the world of books as we know just books all around the world there are some absolutely so many amazing stories if only we all had time to read them all <laughs> we never do anything read, else <laughs> yeah do you get to read a, a fair bunch of them I do yeah when when I get when they send me samples to use as giveaways and things I, I delve in and, and read as much as I can yeah it's really great so yeah. your own process as an author, do you have like a particular routine or, or thing that you do to get into that, that sort of zone? What are some of your challenges? How's that all going? I, I think I still haven't maybe found my routine, seeing as I'm really only writing my second full novel at the moment. Um, I've pretty much worked out I'm not a full-on plotter, but I need to have uh, some structure. And... Um, when our mutual friend, Ang Harrod, suggested the Save a Cat, um, which is a screenwriting book, but there's also this version written for novels, that has been 
that was a big breakthrough with this latest book. So I think, you know, there's there's so many tools and there's so many how-to books out there. Uh, you kind of need to just keep browsing them until you find the one that resonates for you for that particular project. That's if, if I've learned nothing else, it's just keep going with all the different ideas and tools and how-tos until you find the one that feels right for you. Yeah. So there isn't, yeah. Sorry. You're still looking, or did you, or, or do you love save the save the cat? I think save the cat. I will definitely do that for the next book. Yeah, I think that's giving me the um, enough of the structure. I, I'm kind of right in between, probably. You know, a full on pantser and a full on plotter, and I need some structure because I know that's helping drive the story forward. And then I've got the opportunity to let my brain just fill in the gaps, or my subconscious fill in the gaps. Yeah. Do you write every day? No. no I, I should. You were like, no. <laughs> no, I should. No. So what does that look like? Do you have to like feel like it's it's time or I mean because you're balancing of course so many things including your full-time job and and that's really why I ask it because you know I imagine there's a lot of listeners who might be trying to navigate that how do you create the balance uh, deal with the guilt when you don't manage to write, does if you leave it too long, does the guilt grow so big that you know, like how does all you're that? Just work? kind of, you just kind of in denial, actually, that you that you, and then if you do feel really guilty, um, I feel quite sorry for the unicorns that keep getting parked in the back paddock. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, no, look, well, I'm just like everyone else, I guess. I struggle with that, with with finding the time and it was not much find the time you need to make the time and make the commitment to yourself if the project is important enough then you're then you're trying to you know you're owing it to yourself aren't you to to give that project time because that's our most valuable resource is it um still second priority to your day job yes sadly it is yeah but that's that's balancing those priorities because you also have to have money. There's no be, no point being a starving artist who's busy trying to write books and sell them. You do actually need to eat and have a life. Yeah, so I think I think worrying about money would be very would be even worse for your creativity. Well, it would be for mine. Ah, oh, that's an interesting statement. Do you think so? For you, worrying about money would make your creativity suffer. Uh, yes, at this point. And my marriage. And your marriage, yes, yes. That we must the real, 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 reality is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and hard. I think that's a really valid point because, you know, for some people, they they might, it might be better for them to go full-time even if they're not making money. For some people, that works. Mm. But like you say, for, for yourself and I'm sure for lots of other people, it might actually make that worse if they were to do that and they need to – just hang in there with the with the day job until they slowly build that side hustle. Yeah, I think I think each person finds their own path in that in that regard. And um, if I had the opportunity, perhaps to stop and write full time, I would. And I'm looking forward to perhaps you know at 65 or or whenever I'm retired, <laughs> whenever if, if I am retired. Um, I can have another 15 years of writing easily, you know, at that point. And wouldn't that be a great luxury to be able to devote time to books all the time? Yeah. We'll see. So you don't even see it as a job, really? Not yet. Like it's fun. It's so fun. it's It's still fun. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm ready for the grind of wanting to get four books out a year or what what people might do as a full-time writer um yeah we'll we'll just see yeah that i know that's hard work and 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 look being creative and and learning your craft it is all hard work but it's um i guess it's being ready for it and you've got you've practiced you know you you have learnt your craft and you're writing every day and you've got your all those systems in place that would help take you forward into that place and i'm probably not quite at that at that stage yet Mm. Yeah, you're still finding finding your way around it all. Yeah, we bet. And when it comes to you know, like you've got you had your book, you're ready to go. Like, what initial things did you do marketing wise? How did you get creative there? Because I know you got quite creative. 
I can't remember what you're talking about, which thing you're well, doing. How did you get your book oh. out? What have you done to get your book out? <sighs> well, tried, uh, do your very best with your covers and your descriptions. Uh, you know, that's just kind of your core to call selling points, aren't they? I did pay to have Brian Cohen write my f- my first blurb um, because it was my first book and I really wanted to give it the best shot. Get it in all the big places, your Amazons, your Ingram Sparks, etc. Um, for the New Zealand market, I did a leaflet, uh, which I sent out to all the public libraries and that actually worked better than I had realised in that... Um, you know, each year they survey the libraries to find how many copies of each book they own. And through the public lending rights system, I, I had nearly 100 copies of Lily and the Unicorn King in New Zealand libraries. And it doesn't sound many in the big scheme of things, but I was really stoked because it was actually several hundred dollars uh, of money that I got, which I wasn't expecting. So that was a real, that has actually paid for most of the cover for the next book and things like that. So that has been, that has been good. Um, That's a massively creative idea. Actually, it seems almost a bit silly in this day and age, but you know, like it works. Like you made a leaflet. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds a bit sort of old fashioned, <laughs> but, but it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely do it again. Um, yeah, I did some newsletter swaps with other authors. I think that can probably be quite effective if you do have a good overlapping market. I don't recall it making a lot of difference to sales it's pretty hard to tell isn't it where what does actually drive sales unless you've got a specific promotion or something going on um i don't feel like i've been madly creative with the marketing of the book but it is it is more than a year ago and i might have forgotten the things that i did do at the time well i find the whole library thing pretty creative actually because okay. uh, you know as Thank you say you. most people just um you know, put their book online at all the big places and they might advertise, you know, that, they might do that. They might do some promotion or book giveaway kind of on social media. But as creative as those things sound, they're not, they're sort of mainstream things to do mm. these days, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, even starting your own online bookshop is pretty creative <laughs> way. <laughs> it's kind of like. Well, it's quite bold, yes. Like, yeah. well, I want to sell more books, so I'm going to find a way to do it. I'll create this website. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I have yeah. sold a few copies, which has been nice. So yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, you know, and I love that it's that it's local. So you've really started from your own home base, and that dedication to people in your own country. Which <laughs> again, you sort of we tend to kind of think, you know, Amazon US because that's yeah. where the kind of big numbers are. But you know you've looked at home for how to get your book into the hands of your local readers. Yeah. And I think, I think COVID last year made mo- most countries, we made us all a bit more parochial. We, you know, we want to look after people at home because um, it's so shipping and freight and everything was much more challenging. Um, are you, yeah, you, you want to see, you know, people locally are struggling. So you want to provide some some way to support them, yeah. So it, sort of the time is the time felt right, definitely. How do you balance finishing a project you're working on, particularly when it goes over such a like long time span? Like you know, you don't write a book in a week; it might take you a year or two years. Yeah, as it slowly emerges, how do you balance that? Um, that kind of motivation and that love for that original story without going, oh, there's a new story that I could write. <laughs> um, you want to have some good writing friends who keep you accountable. I think that's very helpful. <laughs> uh, and and I guess I'm probably, yes, I have the other ideas have been coming and I maybe let myself go and write a first chapter, but I'm quite tenacious in that it's a promise to myself that, and the readers who have read the first, first book that they are actually waiting on a second book. And yes, it has taken quite a long time to get written. And yes, I've spent many months dithering around and getting lost in the story and hating the story and being bored by the story. But actually, I'm quite excited about it. And I know what needs to happen for the last four chapters. So that's quite, it's quite an incentive to get it actually finished. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love that. A promise to yourself 
yeah. and a promise to your readers. And at those moments where you think, oh, let's just write something else that you come back to that. And again, I feel like your theme today is, is that, that courage, that braveness to even though you got, you get stuck or there's times where you hate it, you keep going until, you know, you get to the end. And I think the first book, it took you quite a lot of years to, to get there, didn't it? Mm, six from when it was first started. And it was basically completely rewritten after the developmental edit was pretty much from scratch. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge effort and a, and a massive mm. commitment. You could have stopped that how many times and gone, oh, forget that. I'll just write something else. Or Yeah, I moved, moved from one end of the country to the other and started a new business with my husband and all that in the middle. Um, I think I do... I think it's because I love the character so much and I and the unicorns and I really wanted their story to be finished, you know, I think they deserved it. And I'd put all the sweat and tears into it. There were lots of tears at times and I just really wanted it to be finished. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it almost makes me wonder whether we, you know, each of us without, and this might not be true for everybody, but uh, sort of thinking out loud whether we each write you know, books initially and maybe forever for ourselves, about ourselves, you know, like now having talked to you, when I go back to, you know, your your tagline thing, which is, you know, fantastical adventures, which kind of sound, fantastical adventure stories, which kind of sounds like your life. I mean, you know, you live in this cool part of New Zealand and you travel from one side to the other about brave friends and what have I been oh. saying about you this entire interview brave 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 right ponies yep always ponies just, you, you know you're about to buy uh, uh, your own horse you're riding uh, you come back to loving horses and getting your own horse and of course unicorns which which shows that there's imaginative part of you that one knows that they're real <laughs> you know and that they're out there it's it sounds like you're writing you know it's you yep. I hadn't, I hadn't actually realised that that tagline pretty much, yeah, pretty much sums up a lot of the things that I've been doing. It's quite amazing. <laughs> Thank and you. I often, I often notice this. I notice this in myself and I notice this in others mm -hmm. that writing can be, and it's not going to be this for everybody, but writing can be very much almost as you write your story, you're having your own personal development particularly in that story. So, for example, when, you know, the, my current character, she, there was no book last year because, you know, my current character, a.k.a. Eleanor Page, was sitting at home homeschooling. She wasn't doing adventures, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like the growth of my character stopped because and now, of course, my growth didn't stop, but mm. that element of my journey stopped. And so she stopped. And no matter how much I tried to push her to go forward, it was like she'd look at me and be like, we're just staying at home this year, babe. So yeah. we're not doing anything, yeah. you know. And um, so almost like we, we learn and grow and develop through our own characters and sometimes yeah. that pauses because we're pausing, you know, sometimes that goes forward again because we're going forward again. Do you have that experience or is this just a me thing? No, no I can see that. Um, the similarities in that, you know, when all of my energy and time outside paying work was being given to developing the website, for example, there was absolutely no room for Sasha to be doing anything with the unicorns in the new book. You know, there was, she just had to wait um, because I didn't have any energy for her at that time. Um, but now I have got energy for her again. And you can really feel like, I'm past being bored with the story now. I've got energy for it. And all of a sudden the story's got energy again. So there'd probably be a bit in the middle I need to edit quite hard to <laughs> move it forward a bit more quickly when I was feeling a bit bored. Um, so, yeah, there's there's some, yeah, perhaps some path, some similarity with your own path of what you're going on in your life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I, I bet that each book you'll get a little bit faster, I reckon. I think that as I really you hope so. Get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard it's pretty typical to kind of, as you, as you said at the beginning anyway, right, that you were learning the craft. And, and while you're always learning, I think that never stops, 
there's that initial learning curve was quite steep, wasn't it? Like, yeah. was it quite steep for you? Yes, when you go from writing 500 word articles for a newsletter to trying to write a 50,000 word book and, and learning what story arcs are and character arcs and um, yeah, all of those sorts of elements that keep the story moving forward, you know, the whole time, you want to write an engaging story that children are going to go, oh, I, can't, I can't put this down until I've, you know, read the next chapter. That's what I, that lights my fire to be able to say when people tell me that sort of thing about my book. So, yeah. I actually found it even really hard, like even after I knew all that stuff or thought I knew that stuff. And then I went to write like my first novel. I kind of went, so like, what do you write? Like, do you write... They said they did this, and then you write a sentence about what they actually said. Like I did, you know what I mean? The actual, the actual format, the actual kind of flow and layout. Do you describe and then do dialogue? Do you now describe a bit more and then do dialogue? Like even that, I feel like no one really teaches you that. No, I get, yeah, I guess not, and because so much of that's a personal style too, and I. I don't really think about that stuff very hard. It just seems to happen. It just flows. So yeah. it perhaps just comes more naturally to you than it does to me. <laughs> Maybe just all those years of actually, like I, you know, I like I type. I, I, I would. I think, feel I'd be faster if I could maybe learn to um, re record books when you record your writing. But that creative process from brain to fingers is so ingrained after sort of 30 years of writing for a living that it's quite hard to 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 change to to speaking it out and, and then having to put all your speech marks in which are so automatic with your fingers um but just, you know opening speech mark john said close the speech mark or whatever <laughs> it's like wow it was how really interesting to see how different that was for my brain to try and work in that process and I, I haven't tried it again since before I've I tried it a few times but um yeah it's just interesting the patterns of of what we're used to yeah some people even like to still handwrite I hear like they prefer that like again I think a different part of your brain mm. gets activated when you're handwriting and mm. there's even a thing where if you write with your opposite hand have you ever heard of that if you write Oh, Try haven't. writing with your opposite hand. It will bring even different things out of you because now it's using the other side of your brain. Yeah. That's not your dominant side of your brain. So that's, I mean, I know that's kind of a technique for sort of, you know, um, like almost counselling yourself or journaling mm -hmm. that I don't know if it would work in storytelling. It'd be so interesting to try. Like, I wonder what would yeah. come out. It's like, would my characters do strange <laughs> things all of a sudden? And uh, I, I can imagine, you know, kids going like, how did you come up with that? And I'm like, write with your opposite hand. And yeah. they look at me like, she's a weirdo. <laughs> I'd like to try that actually while um because I I plot by hand my initial sort of what if questions ha happen by hand and then I've got a book to refer to sort of how it's all going to come together and I actually I'll try and remember to do that next time. We are able with to read the writing as another right. matter, but <laughs> <laughs> might how be do interesting. you come up with your ideas? Like, do they just pop into your head, or do you have to kind of work them a little bit? They just they're so often just there. Um, they just turn up. Yeah, I've been plotting. I have been plotting an adult story actually lately. Um, set in the high country with horses, um, and that just that's like oh well, I've been wanting I've been wanting to write this story for quite a long time, and it's kind of been noodling around in the back of my brain, and it's just I do I don't know where I read it, but it was something a long time ago. I read you know when you're going to sleep. Ask your subconscious a question. You know, oh, I, look, what's this character going to do in response to whatever? And it's amazing how often I will wake up with the answer. When you go, oh, yes, that is what needs to happen. Yeah, so it's it, yeah, there's stuff going on in there that you don't know. You can't understand. And is it kind of like a, a thought when it comes to you? Is it like a knowing? Is it like a visual? Like in what way does it arrive? Yeah, for me, it's yeah, be a, a thought or a knowing. I don't, re I don't, I don't uh, plot or imagine things very visually. I'm not, um, not a movie. The movie doesn't play out in front of me. But um, yeah, it's a thought. Or mm. Mm, that's so interesting. Yeah, have you tried the subconscious thing? 
going away and asking your subconscious? No, no, I have not tried that, but I'm going to put it on my to-do list. That yeah. sounds like a really useful, useful one. I don't know if it would work or if my brain is just falls asleep before I fall asleep when I go to bed. It's like, oh. <laughs> but, you know, it's, you never it's, know. Worth, it's worth a try. And I know uh, Cal Newport, who has written the, wor- the book Deep Work, mm-hmm. he talks about, like, cognitively training your brain. So, mm-hmm. like, when you go for a walk, he says, you know, rather than listening to a podcast or listening to stuff, he, he says, like, train your brain to think about that thing. Like, so think about, for example, your character and what it's going to do next. And he talks about how your brain wants to go off. It, wants, it will try to go off to other thoughts, but it's a bit almost like a meditation. You have to try to bring it back. Mm. And I've been trying to do that a little bit, but gosh, that's hard. That's hard, yeah. I actually find it really tricky because, again, I, I'm like, you know, come on, character, what are, you gonna, what are we going to do today? And she sort of looks at me like, I'm not going to tell you while we're walking. And I'm like, no, please, this is what Kel <laughs> Newport said you have to do. <laughs> so we, so would that come to you more when you sit down at the keyboard and then she starts talking to you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I almost feel like she refuses to talk unless those hands are near a keyboard because she's like, you, my friend, are going to forget everything (laughs) I've told you. But I just find this, you know, so fascinating how different people come up with their ideas because, you know, I'll often hear people in podcasts talk about, I plot or I pants. And and I think, but how, how do they plot? Like, does the ideas just come to them or do they try to sort of, force it out or, or how does it actually come yeah when when i do that kind of what if plotting at the start it, for me that is very much you might be sketching out 10 ideas for that first chapter and then and then you reread them and you're thinking and and they are just like well what if this happened and it quite um methodical process oh well but what if that happened? And then the next idea pops in here. Oh, but what if that happened? And then you go, ah, oh. or if I can add a twist to that, the unexpected. Oh, now we might be onto something. You know, sometimes it's like the tenth or eleventh thing that comes out, and you're, and then you go, but and if I can do this little twist on it, does that make the story just stand out that little bit more that it might work? You know. And I, I like you, I try, I, I think about characters when I go walking. I, I can't listen to music or podcasts. I prefer that time out in the open anyway. And But also, luckily there's no one around where I live because I'm often talking to myself as if I'm a character going, but the lilia, the lilia, the lilia. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's going to work. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I love that. And I'm jealous. Like, I need to walk out somewhere where I can talk to myself without looking like <laughs> Yeah, you know, but weirdo. maybe yeah. it doesn't matter. Probably everybody goes, "Oh, there's that colourful lady coming along," and now she's talking to herself. Uh, so it might it might just fit my my public persona. <laughs> but yeah, that's so good. So you you do go out and actually give your characters. What I'm hearing is you give your characters time to talk to you. Mm. outside of your writing time, which maybe I don't do, actually. Maybe I tell them to shush, shush, not until my fingers are near the keyboard. I mean, it mightn't be a big thing. It might be just sort of like what, you know, literally what is going to happen next or how can I make that scene a bit more complicated? And they're going, oh, but I really want to do that. And then you go, oh, well, actually, I'm going to make it more complicated by having that happen. Um, so, yeah, perhaps it's it's, it's not a huge and conscious thing necessarily when I'm when I'm walking, but it, it is nice to take that time when you've got it to to let them have a life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the what if that's such a great tip. It's just like I did hear that before actually. Now that you've said it, it's reminded me. I think it might have been Disney does this that they they get everybody to brainstorm, and the first twenty ideas they throw out because almost like they'll have been done before they'll have picked them up from somewhere Mm. and then they then your brain moves past into the much more novel ideas which Mm. the brain's not so comfortable putting up straight away because initially if it hasn't been done before it's really novel it thinks it's a bit weird and it might get laughed at or it might be really too much you know Mm. so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
uh, I will have I will have read the advice somewhere in my one of the many how to books that I have. I've got absolutely dozens of them. Um, so you know, you just pick up you pick up the things that work for you, I suppose, or they're the things that you find act- that you actually use. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who has you know written their book? They've you know they're going to publish it. Let's say themselves for this case scenario. Mm. They're brave enough to back themselves. They're going to, you know, it's all been done as professionally as possible and they're about to put it out into the world. What's your advice? (sighs) That it is brave. You have been brave to getting to that point and I know you've done lots and lots of hard work. Um, Don't have high expectations. You're probably not going to set the world on fire and um, one of our mutual writing friends told me that and she was absolutely right i did think my unicorns were going to set the world on fire but you know not quite yet in time um what else would i say to them just um there will be highs and there will be lows and the first five star review you get will be just fantastic or the first reader feedback you know that really mean something to you that that will be amazing and so really savor those moments of highs and know that there will be shitty bits when you just haven't sold anything for weeks or you get a one star review and I, I've had one I'm in the club now I'm in the official club of one star reviews and it's a bit of a rite of passage, passage perhaps as I'm in the author to work through um yeah stick it out and also get on with your next book don't muck around just get on with the next story yeah. Such good advice. Was it? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for being on the show, Kate. I've learned so much from interviewing you today. Thank you, Elna. I, did, I didn't realise I had so much I knew, but there you go. Oh, there you are. Well, of course you have so much you know, because that's why you're actually out there in the world doing it. But you're right. Sometimes we don't realise how much we know until we start talking about it with somebody else and i really appreciate this time to be able to really talk through some of those things with you because that's how we all really grow and learn and i have learned heaps just from talking to you today that's fantastic well i'm really really pleased to have had the opportunity to do so so thank you so as usual all of the links to kate and to kiwi kids or kiwi books will be on the in the show notes And once again, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Eleanor. Lovely to see you. Did you find that interview valuable? Great. Now be an awesome human and go and leave a review because it helps the podcast out so much. Want to read the show notes? Check out thechildrensbookauthorpodcast.com. Want to find out more about me, Eleanor Page? Find me at eleanorpage.com or come and say hello on social at Eleanor Page Books. Until next time, keep writing and keep learning.